Um, okay, so thanks again for, for joining us, sharing your story. Um, and you, so you were diagnosed with Ewing sarcoma, and how old were you at the time? I was uh, 20. Wow, okay. Very yeah. young, and I know you're still very young. It's all happened um, fairly recently. Can you start by telling us um, how, how you knew something was wrong? Um, well, I'm into climbing uh, when I was in university, and like one week, I was just like, really like there was an ache in my arm, and I was just like, you know, like doing climbing with the, my boyfriend and my friends, and I was like, you know, I feel like there's something up with my arm. I don't know what it is, but I just felt like the right, my right arm was just... Um, was less strong than the other one so and then I waited approximately like months and after I felt a lump in my arm and I went to the doctor and uh, she probably said that it was a, a attendant who was probably I you know I probably went climbing and my attendant just you know like kind of I don't know ripped apart and I don't know I, I kind of have some kind of a uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> I had a, um, probably like an ache or something that happened. So we went to do an MRI and then we saw that the, there was a fracture in the radius. So we didn't know if it was from sports or either, you know, from other things. So that's why, um, my, um, my, um, sorry, my, uh, doctor called me and said that, I would have to go see an oncologist. So yeah. Wow. Okay. So that was very quick. Um, do you remember what month in in 2018 you first started feeling the aches in your arm? Um, probably at the big, like probably September 2018. Yeah. Okay. And then it took you um, a couple months to then get the first MRI. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the first MRI was uh, in December 2000, uh, yeah, 2018. So, so then, yeah, it came back. Um, your doctor said you may need to go see an oncologist. How did, how did your doctor make that jump again, though? Because it was a fracture in the arm, but it, they, they could tell it wasn't because you physically heard it. It was something else. Yeah, that's why the, um, the technician at the MRI, uh, MRI told me, uh, she was like, oh, you know, did you like break something doing a sport? And I was like, no, I don't remember like, you know, hurting myself. So um, the technician said, well, if you didn't hurt yourself, I think it's serious. It's more like if there's something in your body that physically like hurts you. So that's why um, my doctor was preoccupied with it. It's so interesting. And at the time, what were you thinking? Because you heard oncologist and, you know, of course it's like, okay, well that's cancer. So what was that situation for you? How did you um, digest that? Um, actually, my doctor called me one morning and she said like the word cancer in the call. And I was like, what? And I just began crying because I didn't know like, I'm not usually like familiar. I was not familiar with cancer before cancer. So, um, you know, like my grandmother had it like, but you know, it was very far from me. I was really young when she, when she had it. So, um, I was really like, I don't know, not familiar with it. So it was, it, it completely like shattered me when I heard the word, because I was like, what is this? And then when I saw the oncologist, it kind of gave me like a little bit of hope because, um, at the first appointment that I went with him, he said, oh, well, it may be benign. It may be a cancer we don't know yet. Let's wait for the biopsy. So that kind of gave me a little bit of hope. Um, so at the start, it was rough. And then after it was like, okay, that may be, you know, some kind of benign tumor. Maybe it's a, you know, fibrome or something else. So, yeah. Right. Because you don't know until the results come back, right? And, and Yeah. So you, you got the MRI in December of 2018. Um, do you remember if it was like the beginning and, and how long you had to wait for your oncology appointment and kind of describe how that went for, for you? Um, well, after the MRI, the, um, my, uh, my appointment with my oncologist like was very fast. It was like probably five days after the MRI. It was very like, because the, um, 
the tumor was very, very big. And my oncologist said that it was probably there for like three years. And I hadn't had any signs of, you know, like maybe I was a little bit tired. That was the only like I was tired and my arm was aching. But apart from that, it, like I hadn't had any big symptoms of cancer. So, um, yeah. What was the question again? <laughs> no, no, no. no, so that's perfect. And so your oncologist, um, when you met her, was it a her or a... Uh, him. I have two. Okay. One that is like my surgeon and the other one that is specialized in uh, my type of cancer. Okay, perfect. So when you first went to the general, on was it the general oncologist first? Or uh, it was your uh, specialist, so sarcoma specialist or? Yeah, I saw both the same day. The same day. Okay, can you describe the visit with both of them? Um, the visit was uh, really weird <laughs> as any like cancer diagnosis you don't really like it's like a wave just coming at you you don't really see it coming um, I went into the office and the my oncologist had an intern with them and the intern was really like kind of you know looking down and really like kind of emotional I think it was this first like diagnosis with a patient so he was really like kind of awkward and just sad and I knew that something was wrong because they were licking down and I was like oh this is not gonna help well and uh, yeah he told me that it was cancer and that uh, I will be doing 14 uh, rounds of chemo and uh, radiotherapy I would have um, an arm that was um, that was gonna be uh, sorry much um like i don't know how to say that uh that was gonna be you know my arm was gonna be different than the other one uh, i would have a surgery and uh, that my life would change and that i will no longer have hair so he put me like through a lot and gave me a lot of information in a little time i think he wanted to get it over with and rip the band-aid off and then uh, yeah we kind of headed out and we told my family and it was a very weird day <laughs> oh yeah. um and, and when had you gotten the um the biopsy done because there was a biopsy done in between right where they had to figure out what it was so it's just yeah. just to make sure the timeline is clear you got your mri and then uh was the biopsy done same day or uh, i think the day after it was really really quick yeah can you describe the biopsy what they did um, the biopsy was really invasive. It was, they had to take, um, the tumor was in the soft tissue and also in the bone. So they had to, to, to take like sample of both. So they did um, a sample of soft tissue in my forearm and they took um, a sample of the bone. So the bone is like a clicking noise. They just take a part of the bone and it's pretty painful um, because they have to get, you know, they just anesthetize, uh, they do it locally. So, uh, and you're not, you know, um, you're not uh, sleeping or anything. It's just local anesthesia. So um, yeah, it was pretty hurtful. <laughs> Wow, I can't even imagine. Um, like I had undergone a bone marrow biopsy, but I think the forearm is just like right there. Um, <laughs> feels. Yeah, I had a bone marrow also, and it was negative, so we were really happy. Oh, that's so good. Was that bone marrow biopsy after though? That was a different day, or was it? No, I think it was the same day. I did all biopsies the same day, and we got the call like a week later to say that for the bone marrow it was clear everything was fine so that was like a great news like no other form of cancer anywhere in the body so we we're pretty happy yes because of course that that can mean a completely different situation um yeah the, the biopsy of your arm because it's so unique to your situation so was it the same instrument that they use for the bone marrow biopsy just like a long needle or was it different and how how would you compare the two experiences um I think it was the same needle. I think it's just the um, the the bone um, sample was like the 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 instrument was a little bit thicker to get like a, a good sample of bone, but pretty much it's the same thing. It's pretty much like a, you hear like a clicking noise and then it pops off. So yeah, <laughs> and, they're pretty and how, similar. And then how how quickly did you do? You remember when you got the results? Was it the day that you had the oncology appointment? Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
So three and, four days later. Uh, yeah, I had my first oncology appointment like the 24th of December. And then we did the biopsy like one or two days later. And then the 7th of January, 2019, we got the diagnostic. I see. Okay. Okay. So you got the biopsies done the first day of your, onco your oncology appointment, not the day of your MRI. Exactly. Got it. Okay. Thank you for clearing that up for me. Um, so you were, you were talking about, um, you know, the, the January 7th appointment, you go in there, the sarcoma specialist with the intern, um, gives you basically, like you said, rips the bandaid off. Um, who's with you at the appointment and how did you tell your other family about your diagnosis? Um, it was my mom and my dad that were there. Um, my brother was working, I think. And uh, yeah, they wanted to be there because obviously when they saw, the, you know, like the oncology unit, they were like pretty pre preoccupied once um, we got, we did the biopsy and uh, the first oncology appointment. So they wanted to be there the, the day of the diagnosis. So um, yeah, they were there and my mom uh, almost fainted. So, and she was, you know, like, in the in the oncologist um like a room or i don't know like a yeah in the in the room there was like a little bed when you like do like the pressure and everything and my mom was just there with the like wet cloth and was just almost faint so that was kind of funny but <laughs> yeah they were, they were the yeah you have to find the humor, right, in the situation sometimes. Exactly. Like, I was there, like, receiving the diagnosis. I didn't, I don't, I don't remember if I cried or anything. I think the day I cried, but in the oncology, like, appointment, I didn't. And my, um, like, my mom and my dad did cry. And it's weird because you're the one receiving the diagnosis and you have, like, all this weight on your shoulder and you find the strength, like, not to cry. And you're, you know, your mom and your dad are crying. so. That's a pretty weird situation, but you know you have to you have to be strong in those moments. So, yeah, right. It is an interesting dynamic, um, yeah. and and I know you had said that you were very unfamiliar with cancer, and so when the oncologist was telling you about sarcoma, first did he say this is Ewing sarcoma? Was he specific about it? And is there staging when it comes to this? Like, how did he describe your cancer? Yeah, um, he explained to me that Ewing sarcoma is a um, pediatric cancer. So it's, um, I'm like, it's between, you get Ewing sarcoma in between 15 and 30 to 35 years old. So, and I'm in, I'm the whole, pretty much, I'm very old <laughs> to say that. It's weird. I'm old to get Ewing sarcoma. Normally it's like people, like young children, or so just like very like young adults that get it so um yeah it's a pediatric cancer normally it's kids who have it and normally it's um men who have it so i was and in the forearm it's uh, weirder because normally it's in the big artery of the body and normally it's in the the you know like um like uh, sorry the legs and uh, the hips so yeah and the arm is very odd so you were like triple lucky <laughs> in that sense. Yeah. And he told me like, you had a 1.9 chance on 2 million to get Ewing sarcoma. So I was like, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> great. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, okay, so after that appointment, what were the next steps? Um, the steps was to get chemo as soon as possible because the tumor was there a long time ago. He said, yeah, you had this for a long, long time, like probably three years, I think. And they didn't tell me the stage. I did. I don't know the stage uh, to this day, but I don't think it's uh, anywhere near stage four or three uh, because I didn't have any... Uh, I just had cancer at one place and all my body was clear. So, yeah. Okay. So that was the good news was that it was localized. It stayed there, um, but they wanted to get chemo started. So I see that just not even a week later, um, you had your first chemo in your, in your timeline. Um, can you describe the chemo regimen that you underwent? Yeah, um, the chemo regimen that I went through was doxyrubicin and ifosfamib. Um, 
Dr. Rubison is called the Red Devil. I don't know if you, <laughs> if you know about this type of chemo. It's pretty, um, it's pretty rough. Um, it gives you like a really big nausea. And uh, I went through my first chemo. And the first bag that they gave me was doxyrubicin. So, um, and it was weird because the chemo is red. And, you know, in movies, you know, you see the chemo and it's just like clear. And I don't know, it just... I wasn't prepared for that and uh, when I went to the bathroom it was obviously red and it was very weird um, but my three friends were my three best friends were there so uh, it was nice to you know have them by my side when I was doing the chemo and um, my mom also was there and they were taking terms coming into my room see I, how I was doing and uh, my friends like made me laugh like all the way through and um, I remember um, one of the, um, there were there were some kind of, um, I don't know how to say in English, there was some, um, uh, some, um, sorry, <laughs> it's not caregivers, but it's like special people who give gift to your first chemo. Random Skypers? Yeah, exactly. And uh, they give you gifts, and it was some little old woman like came into my room and gave me like a blanket. A water bottle, um, some like candy to chew on during chemo. And she was so cute, and they gave me some like drawing that some kid did in the school and said like, "Have a good first chemo. Like I'm behind you, and you have like the name of the little kid that you know draw draw you something." So it was pretty cute. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that must have been such a welcome. Yeah, and I keep the drawing like every time I was doing my chemo, I put it in the bag so um I put it in my chemo bag to just you know to remind me that you know if to remind me that people are behind me like I have like some kind of I have family I have people that care for me so yeah well, I didn't know who the child was but it was it was a cute ritual yeah, very touching, it sounds like. Um, and, and speaking of the, the chemo again, I mean, so you would go in for the doxyrubicin. Um, how long was the infusion? And then um, you, you mentioned a second drug, right? So it was yeah. two drugs. It was at the same day. How many hours was it? And then would you go back? Like, how, how long were the cycles? Would you go back once every two weeks or once every three weeks? Uh, once every three weeks and I had two different types of chemo so um, one was the doxyrubicin and the ifosfamil. Um, isfosfamide I think in English I'm not sure um, but yeah I had two types of chemo one that the infusion was four hours and um, the other one I was having a five-day stay at my hospital to get ifosfamil because the one type of chemo that uh, made your um, bladder um, uh, yeah was yeah, sorry. <laughs> that was uh, making my bladder more like sensitive and I could have uh, blood in it. So I would have to go uh, for a five day stay just to check on me, check on my bladder, see how, how I was doing. And I had like for a five day stay, I have uh, three hours of infusion a day. Wow. Okay. So um, would it be you'd go to the hospital and then get the doxorubicin for four hours? and then they would start the second drug and you'd have to do that three hours each day for five days at the hospital? Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> it was one, like two types of chemo. One is four hours and I just went in and went out of the hospital. And three weeks later, I would have a five day stay. Oh, I see. And, and in the five day stay for that second chemo, uh, how many, uh, it was three hours. Was it every day for three hours or? Yeah, every day. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And and can you describe, let's go with the doxorubicin first. Um, describe, you know, what side effects you would start to feel and, and when did you start to feel them? Um, probably like the infusion was four hours, but I began to feel like some like side effects two hours after the first infusion. I think, yeah, it's like a big nausea, um, you know, like kind of, you feel like, like really foggy. It's like you're in a dream almost, like it's, 
my regimen is like really strong with the one of the strongest one according to my oncologist with leukemia so it's a pretty strong regimen so it makes you like a little bit loopy you want to it's difficult to talk and um, you feel really sleepy like I would go to my house after my treatment and I was just I would sleep like probably 16 hours a day so really tired did you get mouth sores or you know um, any other aches and pains vomiting yeah I like um I had um infu uh, infusions yeah called the uh, gastrophil injections sorry injections uh after to get my um my white cells up and uh that would cause me to have like really like a, a big bone ache like my body was hurting a lot because I wasn't producing enough um, white blood cells and with that comes the mouth sores and the mouth sores I didn't have them like the first treatment it came like probably like at the end like probably at my eighth chemo nine chemo when my body was uh you know kind of tired of all the chemo and that my web my white blood cells was uh, really low Thanks for explaining that. And and how long would the symptoms persist? Uh, and that's the first part of the question. The second is, what helped you, um, you know, keep those side effects away or keep them down? Like, were there any things that you did or medicine that you took that helped? Um, I took some pills that gave me some um, some appetite that they prescribed me. But I also... Um, was on uh, THC and CBD oil, which helped me a lot with, um, you know, body aches and the, my appetite was, um, was better when I took the oil. So yeah, uh, I like to be an advocate for that because I know it's kind of taboo to talk about that, but, um, I know some cancer patients don't believe in like THC or CBD, but I really believe in it. So that helped me a lot with it. Perfect. And and how long did those side effects last for you? Like, were they gone pretty much after three days, four days, or was it persistent? Um, like the first regimen, like the five, um, sorry, the four hour injection, it was probably like two weeks of side effect. And uh, the last, like, because my chemo was every three week, I had a, like a week when I was like good, you know? Like that I was like, no, like I had no side effect. Like my energy went up and I could go like do walks in the park with my mom and my grandmother. So that was nice to have like kind of a, a week, a break, you know, between chemo. So yeah. Absolutely. Cause you need that so you can get yourself back up for the next infusion. Exactly. By, by the way, were, did you have a pick line or a port or did they? Uh, yeah, I have a port account. Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, and w and when you got that done, anything you want to say about the port surgery? I know it's, um, um, it's for me, it was really like, it, it was weird because when I got the port, uh, installed, like the next day, like the port, like the insulation was awesome. Like I didn't feel anything, but like the day after, like the, like two weeks after, like they put it, it's just like a weird feeling. You have something that is kind of feel like a extra like I don't know it feels like it's something is wrong with your body like something is uh I don't know like extra terrestrial a little bit and you're like what is this but yeah you get used to it now it's like part of my body like I was afraid to show it before like when I went to like the spa and when I would go like uh, you know to a pool that was really like not ashamed of it but it made me like kind of different and I knew that so I wanted to you know hide it but now it's just not a problem you know I mean I had a I have scars all over my body and a port cap it's like a part of me now like battle scars right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly um okay thanks for describing that and so then you would have one good week and then you'd go in and get the other chemo done yeah. Um, can you describe that process? Because that sounds a lot more intense. Yeah, um, the five day stay, like the first five day stay that I um, that I did at my hospital, I was so stressed out because I have never slept in a hospital ever. 
and just hearing the beeping at night it just it, it made me like so like i don't know stressed out i was just always like eyes wide open like the first night i was like what is happening i was trying to you know like process all of that and um my nurse that was with me um the first night that i got there was like you know like take a shower like breathe like she, she noticed that i was like really nervous and like restless i would like go to the bathroom like every 10 minutes like i was really like yeah restless so um the second stay the second uh, time i went to the hospital for this type of chemo i was a lot more like calm i was calmer and i was just like in peace with it but the first like few nights it was it was really weird a lot to get used to a lot of adjustments. yeah um and so when you would go to the hospital for the stay um they would give you the infusion and then you know can you describe what every day was like in terms of the like you know i know nurses have to check up on you a lot um did you have to go through any scans while you were there and and of course blood tests is part of it yeah um i had a blood test every day for uh, the five days day so every morning i would wake up with the nurse that was just waking me up that was like can I take your bloods and I was like yeah yeah sure so um it was a weird you know it's, it's weird waking up to a nurse just over you <laughs> but um yeah and you know you you kind of you you get you get used to it you know you just you bring books um you you know I was playing on my computer watching films a lot and um you get used to it but the first time it was like it's boring you know it's an, it's a hospital you know you just go around and i would there's a little like uh the little flower garden at my hospital i would go there and just kind of you know watch and you know doing pretty boring stuff but that's what i had to do in order to get better so yeah and and to pass the time and and yeah. how about the side effects for this particular chemo um what did you get and how long did they last um this chemo was actually like l like less um it was better than the other one uh it was just fatigue pretty much it was really like and a little bit of nausea but not as bad as as the other one like i hate the doxyrubicin, like the, the other type of chemo, way more than the five-day stay. The five-day stay is just when you get your mind to just accept the fact that you're here for five days, like it's pretty much like you're done. Like it's not a problem. But the other one is much more intense. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, and so how long did you have to do this chemo, both of the chemos, how long did they last? Um, they last, um, I did 14 uh, cycles of chemo during one year. So, yeah. Okay, so 14 cycles, <clears throat> meaning that um, in each cycle is three weeks. So yeah, long time. and sometimes it would be like four weeks, depending, like I had a transfusion, so that, you know, um, like uh, th this would take longer, like the process would, uh, yeah. normally it would take like, uh, 10 months but it took it, it took me a year just because I had some you know I went to the ER three times you know I had you know so yeah <laughs> goodness um what what were the causes of your ER trips um the first time around I had a cold so that made um my uh, pressure very high and my bloods were very low and uh the other two times is that I was just um uh, my white blood cells was uh, very uh, was very low, so I was neutropenic. So uh, yeah, that's why. I, and I did some kind of I, I had fever, but not a lot. But you know, thirty eight. So I went to the ER every time. So yeah. And so the, they wanted you to go to the ER because if you're neutropenic, you're highly susceptible to infection. Is that why? Like, what did they do at the ER to help you? Um, the first time around when I had the cold, they, um, oh, actually I forgot to mention that. Yeah. The, sorry. The, the second time that I went to the ER, I had a cold. And the first time that I went to the ER, I had C. difficile. I don't know if, 
it's it's in French. I don't know if there's a word in English for that, but um, it's an infection uh, that when I had my um, operation in my arm, it's an infection that goes into your body once you get operated. So it's in the hospital, like um, it's like the flu, pretty much. Is so sepsis? after I got, par pardon? Sepsis or? Uh, no, I don't think it's that. It's like, it's sort of the flu. It's like, um, it's like a virus that, you know, hospital have. And when I got operated, um, when I was in the waking room, there were like four people. And I think one of the four people had, uh, the virus and gave it to me. Oh my gosh. So I was operated and, uh, I went home the day after. And then three days later, I was back in the ER because I had the, the virus. Okay. Yeah. Usually that's not part of the plan, obviously. No, 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 no. Usually you're supposed to rest. <laughs> but yeah, for Easter last year, um, that's why my mom and me were, were talking about that yesterday. She was like, oh, we're going to stay like, um, because of coronavirus, we're going to spend Easter um, you know, at home. And I was like, it's better than last Easter. And we were stuck in the ER, uh, just me, you know, like vomiting and having the flu. So, yeah. It sounds so terrible. I'm glad that's in the rear view mirror behind you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, and again, just to be clear, so you did a whole year of this chemo, 14 rounds or cycles, and it alternated between the doxorubicin and the five day stay each time. Exactly. Alternated. Okay. Um, and then I see that you had your surgery, um, in April. Yeah. So, so, so they wanted, so they, I guess they just wanted to have the chemo shrink the tumor enough. Like what was the thought, uh, behind exactly. the surgery? Exactly. You're, uh, you're, you're right. The, um, the, you know, the chemo was supposed to, yeah, shrink, uh, shrink the tumor. And, uh, after we did the operation was, uh, which was, uh, resection of the radius, um, they removed 13 centimeters of radius, so that was a big operation. And uh, yeah, and now I'm, you know, my arm is a, a little bit, uh, it's kind of, uh, yeah, it shrinked a little bit, so, and the uh, the bone is different. I see, okay, and we'll talk about the surgery you're going to get later um, in just a bit. But can you describe that surgery? Um, I'm sure you were under <laughs> and sleeping yeah. that one. Um, do you remember the prep and 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 how you woke up? Um, I woke up very sick because of the anesthesia. I think I, I had some sort of reaction. Um, yeah, I was vomiting a lot and uh, was feeling pretty nauseous, and it was hurting a lot. You know, it's not every day that your body is just removed of a bone <laughs> so um it was it was a really weird feeling and when i woke up i just remembered that um i was you know moving my other end and i wasn't able to move the other one and it was really weird it was just like i hadn't you know i wasn't having co complete control of my body and it was yeah it was special to um experience that yeah, and, and that's a it's a pretty big surgery, it sounds like. So how, how long did, was, was the surgery? Um, approximately, like, it was supposed to take four hours, but it took, like, six because they wanted to save some nerve that um, uh, made me able to move my finger, and they were able to save it, but um, the uh, operation, uh, it made the operation longer. Mm, gotcha. Um, and and uh, how long did you have to recover in the hospital and and, and uh, describe that recovery for us? Um, it was uh, I was only getting the operation and staying for a one uh, one night stay, and then after I would get to go home. So it wasn't that bad. Um, they put me under a lot of uh, anesthesia and just give me a lot of drugs to just a lot of morphine to handle the pain because it was a lot <laughs> even with the with the morphine so I was seeing in um, a six patient room which was loud <laughs> very very loud um, usually at my hospital I'm used to being alone in my room for my chemo and I thought um, that was going to be the same for the operation when I wake up when I woke up but I was with six people so yeah. wow <laughs> yeah <laughs> 
Um, and, but you were able to go home the day after, is that right? Yeah. Okay. And how, how was the recovery at home? Like how long did it take to finally be able to use your hand or feel the same? Um, I had a cast for a month and a half, so I wasn't able really to, um, move my hand a lot. And after a month and a half, they decided to start the radiotherapy. So um, they would put me, uh, they would remove the cast, uh, do my radiotherapy, and then re, uh, redo the cast after. So, yeah. Okay, gotcha. And since you're talking about that, um, the, the radiation that you got, um, it says summer of 2019. So was it like the start of June, basically, around the early? Yeah, exactly. Um, I had a 36 uh, session of radiotherapy. So it, it was like a month and a half long. Wow. And how, so it was, um, every other day or not, or it was, I guess it was every day almost. <laughs> yeah. Every day, um, Monday to Friday. And I had, um, Saturday and Sunday to rest. And then after I would, I would be back for the week for a month and a half. Wow. Can you describe the radiation or radiotherapy? Uh, the radiotherapy wasn't that bad, actually. Um, I know for some people, like, it makes them a lot, like, um, it makes them, like, sleepy and just really tired. But for me, it wasn't that bad. Um, for sure, I was tired in the end. But, um, you know, they would just remove my cast and do radiation, uh, like, you know, where you would go, like, into a tanning bed, you know, just sit there and relax they would put on music um so my favorite like spotify playlist the nurse was were really cool and uh were really nice to me uh, when i was doing radiation so um it wasn't that bad okay and how long did each session last um it wasn't that long it was like seven minutes and it was on my arm so i wasn't having like i know some people get radiation like near like on their breast so it um it makes like their organs like work different and they have some side effects. But for me, it was the arm. So it was pretty much harmless. Okay, good. So again, that, that made it a little bit more simple. Um, and so you did that for every day uh, outside of the weekends for about a month and a half. And at what point did, um, I mean, that was pretty much going to be the entire treatment then. When did they do the PET scans to see uh, what your tumor status was? Um, the PET scans, uh, the, my first one? Yeah. How, I guess how many did you undergo and, and when were they? Um, I had approximately, uh, I think three PET scans, one at the beginning, um, with my two biopsies that I talked to you about, um, one six month, uh, after my first chemotherapy to see if the chemo was working and, uh, one, uh, a year after, uh, the first chemotherapy. At the very end. So one was basically in the middle of your chemo and one was after the treatment was, was done, but before yeah. radiation, or, um, I guess that was after radiation too. Yeah. yeah. So can you describe in the, the middle um, PET scan, what did it show? Um, the middle PET scan showed that there was still some activity in the arm. So that was disappointing. Um, but the tumor shrinked a lot. So we were happy, you know, like the chemo worked. But my oncologist said, you know, there was some activity in your arm, we, you know, we expected that the tumor would completely be gone. And uh, during the operation, we, um, you know, during the operation, they, uh, uh, they would, uh, my oncologist thought that it, would, that it would be a better idea to remove the tumor and to remove the bone. So they had to do two things instead of just removing the bone. So, yeah. Gotcha. Okay. And um, do you remember how long it took to get your results? Because I know in, you maybe you've heard the English term scanxiety, where yeah. you're waiting <laughs> for the results. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it depends. Like for me, like a PET scan, it takes like two weeks to get the results approximately. It's not always two weeks. Sometimes they're going to call you like three weeks after, but the two weeks, like, prior to the result you're just waiting for the call to wow. see if it's all right 
Yeah. Two weeks sounds like a long, I mean, compared to other people I've talked to and compared to my own experience, two weeks sounds like a long time to get results. Yeah. Uh, well. <laughs> um, yeah. But maybe it's just, yeah, maybe, um, I guess, how did you pass the time? Like, how did you help keep yourself calm and not think too much about the results? friends, family, a good support system. And also I would say to myself, like, don't think about it. And if you're sad about it, you're just wasting this time, like being stressed out and just feeling anxious. And you want to just, you know, you want to be in the moment and just, uh, yeah, like be there before like you know if everything is about to collapse you'll better be off be happy in this moment now so live in the present is what you're saying yeah. enjoy okay um and then you had your last pet scan it was after your chemotherapy after the surgery after the radiation what did that pet scan show uh that everything was clear and uh, actually was like uh about a week ago that my oncologist called me and said that it was like really promising results and I was really happy. I cried of joy. <laughs> I said to my mom, I'm so happy. I, I mean, I don't know. So yeah, I was really happy about it. I mean, you finally get that great news and it's been a whole year. Um, and, and so when was that actually? When did you, so you said last week your oncologist called you? Yeah. Last week, um, he said that, yeah, I was doing a PET scan to see if, you know, there was no relapse after the chemo and the radiation. And I was really anticipating that call because I wanted to be like cancer free and just had the kind of the label on it. So, yeah. And, and to be clear, that was the, the last, that was the third PET scan that you had just, yeah. it was very recent. Wow. Well, congratulations. That's Thank you. Such good news. Um, and I can feel your excitement. Um, how, how can you describe, I guess, uh, what that meant for you to get that call? Um, it was like really emotional because like I felt like in the last year I wasn't having any like kind of control over my life. And now I, I don't know, I feel like I have like a, some sort of path and I'm just like, going like following this path and just living my life as I would prior cancer so it's great to see you know after the old coronavirus thing like I could do like activities go out with my friend like just like to not be scared of germs anymore because my you know I was really weak at the time uh, when I was doing treatment so just experiencing life to its fullest I guess Wonderful. And I, I do want to ask you about, I mean, what an interesting time we're in right now. Um, but um, I forgot to ask you because of course, hair and hair loss can be um, something a lot of people worry and are nervous about. So can you describe um, for you the, the hair loss? Like, did it start pretty quickly? And when did you decide, okay, I'm just going to shave it? Um, well, um, for my hair, I um, listened to my uh, oncology nurse, Judy, um, and she said to me to shave my head after the first treatment, because normally with Ewe sarcoma, uh, with the chemo regimen, your hair starts to fall out um, after the second chemotherapy. So I was, uh, after the, you know, the first treatment I had like a little like buzz cut that uh, my hairdresser made me like a little pixie cut, which I loved. Um, and then after my first uh, chemo treatment, we did a shaving party at my house. We put um, some trash bag all over my living room and we just shaved it off. And we, <laughs> we actually like, you, I did a, a mullet on my head, so we laughed a lot, you know, played music. It was really, really fun. It was really empowering, actually, to shave my head. It's like I was having some type of control over this situation that I was, like, you know, put in. So, um, yeah, it was really fun. And then after my second chemo treatment, you know, my hair was, um, I was uh, shaved uh so you know little like hair follicle will would fall out and i was like oh thank god i've shaved my head because i wouldn't be able to bear like 
um, losing a lot of hair. I had pretty long hair um, prior to cancer, so yeah. Yeah, it's it's can be traumatizing, right? If you actually see the clumps of hair, so yeah, my nurse was like, "You don't want to see that. You don't want to clog your drain. It's pretty traumatizing. So just shave it off, get it over with." So yeah. Um. So okay, wonderful. Is there anything else that you want to say to people before we, the last section where we just talk about the the mental and emotional parts of this? Um, is there anything you wish you had known um, that you ha- wish you had done differently during treatment or? Um, I think I would, um, I would have uh, go um, on the internet to, you know, um, have a community like quicker because I didn't know at the time, like at the beginning of my cancer journey that so many p- people were living the same thing as me. So, um, I would go on social media and just, you know, like told my story a lot quicker. So I would have like the support system that I would have now, but I'm happy that, you know, everything fell into place, um, in the end, but yeah. That's wonderful advice. Just find your community, right? So you don't feel so. Yeah. There's a lot more people in this than you think. (laughs) Absolutely. Um, okay, great. And then, so you had mentioned coronavirus already, because I know your surgery, you're going to have one more surgery, and that's to realign your forearm. Is that right? Yeah, because um, here was the radius, and the other bone uh, is compen- compensating for the other one, so it's shifting a lot. I don't know if you see, oh. but it's shifting a little compared to the other one. So it's just to realign uh, the bone, basically. Okay. And is it just aesthetic or does it actually change your function, like the way you can use your arm and your hand? Um, it will eventually change uh, the function. Like actually, like you see how much like the movement is not the same. Um, I'm a little bit more restricted um, on uh, my right uh, arm, but it will be aesthetic. And also um, I could use it um, I could use uh, my arm better in the future. You know, I could write, but I'm practicing to write on my, with my left arm. So yeah, I'm practicing. So, that's very interesting. Yeah. Cause it, so you're right-handed then. Yeah. So for people who um, are going to deal with this, um, any advice about how to, you know, compensate for, I mean, cause that's your dominant hand and, and you probably don't realize how often you need to use it until you lose it. Right. Yeah, um, you know, at the beginning, I was really like, like bullheaded. I was like, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use my right arm, and you know, despite like the restriction that I have with it, I'm just gonna use it. But over time, I don't know, it's just kind of shifted, and I would like, I would uh, see myself like eating with the left arm. I was like, oh, like that's weird. So I was doing like basic course with. Um, my left hand and it kind of you know like I don't know like the human instinct just like took off and I just kind of started using my left hand so yeah. got it got it um okay so I do want to ask so yes again about coronavirus we're in a very interesting time you know you get the call that okay all clear and it's such a celebration how is it though to get that news and then you know you still have to be maybe super careful. I don't know. Like, are your white blood cell counts still recovering? Like, I'm not sure where that is, but h- how is it right now living in a time of, of quarantine? It's, it's weird because I was saying that to my mother. Like, I was feeling like I had my liberty again. And then now, like, I'm like, I've been put in my home and I'm restricted to do like everything that I wanted to do, but I know it will come like someday, you know, like China is just beginning to, you know, like um, reflourish um, after the coronavirus. So I'll guess, you know, like for, for Montreal and for the, the, the city that I live in, you know, we're not that bad comparing to European, uh, country but it's you know being being in my room and just you know occupying myself it's just like I was saying to my mother it's like it's been a year that I've been in my room I want to go out I want to do like some things that a 21 year old would do but 
for now I can't do them. So I'll, I'll just have to be, you know, accepting of that and seeing that I'm just lucky to be here, lucky to be alive and to be here. Yeah. Wonderful perspective. Um, and you actually just mentioned it. So you're 21. Um, and, and, and as you said, Ewing sarcoma, a pediatric cancer. So um, how, how tough was it, I guess, to go through this as such a young cancer patient? Uh, were there, you know, things that were good about it? Uh, things that you really hated about it, you know? Um, things I really hated about it is um, that I was the, we have a sarcoma unit in my hospital, and I'm the youngest one. So, you know, like people have known me for that, like nurses, like um, pa even patients that are that. It's like, oh, look at the youngest patient of the sarcoma, sarcoma unit. Like sometimes I love it because like, you know, nurses, like, people that work there just, like, recognize me, like, almost instantly, and they were really, like, compassionate and really sweet with me, but sometimes it's just, like, I was going through the sarcoma unit with some old people looking at me, like, oh, she's too young, and having, like, pity for me, and I wasn't, I, it made me, like, kind of, I don't know, angry, and I, uh, I don't, I, at the time, I, I wasn't prepared for that, and I didn't want people to have pity for me. So yeah, absolutely, um, not a good feeling. But but being such a young um, cancer, and now you know now I don't want if you use the word survivor or thriver or or what. Um, but do you feel like it's changed your perspective on how to live life, and and now gives you this? So you're so young, right? So now you have so many years ahead of you to to live life in a different way. Has it changed your perspective? Oh, it changed my perspective for sure. I mean, I said to uh, my friend, like the Ariane before was much more naive about life and about even like relationships. And now I can, you know, live my life in the present time, live in the moment and just to understand also, um, you know, like um, depression and what anxiety feels like. Like before, I was I was not like comfortable with the term like depression and what is anxiety. I mean, people were talking to me about it, but I wasn't able to really understand it. And now I can really like help people with it. And yeah, you touched on something so important, and I really do love to talk about the mental health piece because we're so focused, of course, on the treatment but our doctors are in charge of that. We have to live with our mental state every single day, right? Um, can you describe how bad it got for you, you know, in terms of, because you had to go through so such a long treatment. Um, when did you start to feel really, you know, down? Did you ever say, okay, I am depressed? And, and how did you get, get through those moments? Yeah, um, uh, when it was my first, key, uh, no, my first oncology appointment, um, they were offering me um, some, uh, uh, some, uh, psy uh, yeah, they were offering me uh, the help of a psychologist, and I instant, uh, instantly took it, um, just because I, uh, I was in you know, able to deal with cancer at the time, I was really stressed out. And if a psychologist is here to help, um, I'm going to take the help for sure. So um, I've done uh, like probably 16 hour, uh, 60 hours of therapy um, now. And now I have the psychiatrist to take care of me. So, you know, it's been a journey, but um, I'm here. And at, in the middle of treatment, I was feeling really kind of depressed and um, I was feeling really helpless and the treatments were really like um, getting on me. I was really, you know, sad and just weak. Um, and then uh, I started to take uh, medication and to see a psychiatrist also helped me um, and now I'm on the journey to find like the perfect medication for me. And I think it's working um, with the help of my psychiatrist. So I'm really happy about it, but it's, it was a process certainly. Yeah. And at, at least it's so promising that you, you listened to yourself, right. And you allowed yourself to, to get that help. What would your message be to people 
um, maybe they're not prepared, uh, you know, to, to ask for help. How, what, you know, how important is it, especially in a situation like this? Um, my psychologist said something to me that really like, um, stick with me. It's just, everybody needs help, whether you're a cancer patient or not. Everybody needs therapy. Everybody has their little, you know, um, they're they're hurting in some type of way and your mental health will stay with you i mean it's in your head um so just really get help um talk about your feelings and if you're not comfortable just talk to a friend like somebody who will listen and you're not alone in that and uh, my psychologist almost uh, said to me that almost like i was i didn't i don't remember like the exact like percentage but like 80 or like 75 uh, percent of cancer patients like in Quebec take antidepressants so it's nothing to be ashamed of. I love that because you have to lift that stigma there's not no shame there this is just human right being human. Um, you mentioned another very key word and that's relationships and I just wondered especially as such a young cancer patient um, did cancer affect your relationships uh, with family with friends? Yeah, I uh, certainly pushed off um, people that uh, wasn't there for me for the right reasons, um, that was uh, really like utilizing me and just not being there um, when I really needed them. And it kind of pushed away the persons that were not really important for me. And the friend that actually came to my chemo and... Um, you know, like my family who also were there for my chemos, you know, were the important ones. And um, really I chose, like I say I have a family and a chosen family and my friends were really like uh, the one that made me um, happy uh, during times that I needed them the most. It's wonderful. So what I'm hearing you say is it really sort of weeded out people who weren't in your life for, for the best of reasons and really solidified the meaningful relationships that you already Exactly. Had. That's beautiful. Um, was, and then I guess wrapping this up, um, was, was there any thought, I'm not sure, I mean, you're so young, but for some people, for women in particular, when you hear about chemotherapy or having to undergo a lot of it, sometimes you think about fertility. Did you mm -hmm. ever have that conversation or thought about that? Yeah, um, actually I had a boyfriend at the time um, and I did the, um, uh, we did prevail, uh, I don't know how to say this, but um, they took out um, some ovules, I don't know. Yeah. So not some eggs, eggs. sorry. Okay, yeah. 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 <laughs> they eggs? took out um, eggs, yeah. So um, they took out on uh, 27, there were 21 eggs that were um, fertilizable, I would say, like they, I could have a baby with it, with them. So um, right now, you know, I may be not fertile, but I'm able um, with these eggs to um, have children uh, in the future. So I'm really happy about that. Um, and yeah. So you got that done before your chemo started? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. It's great just to have uh, an insurance policy. And by the way, I know we went through different chemos, but just as a personal aside, I also froze, we froze embryos, my husband and I, but we, we ended up having um, a, a baby girl naturally recently. Oh, and I went through like congrats. 700 hours of chemo. So I was really scared. So I just want to tell you personally, you know, <laughs> that. Yeah. Sometimes that's what my oncologist says. Sometimes you don't even need the, the eggs. You just have a baby and just a, a miracle. Yeah, absolutely. Um, is there anything else from your experience, like surprises or things you wish you would have known that you'd like to share with, with other people? Um, I would say we didn't talk about like body positivity. Also in sarcoma, it's so important because there's a lot of resection. There's a lot of operation with sometimes you, you know, limb loss or, you know, things that could happen in the way with a sarcoma patient. And um, at the beginning, you know, I was really kind of wearing baggy clothes and just not really like 
exposing my body to people just because I um, wasn't confident and you know I was being asked a lot of questions like what happened to your arm you, did you fall off your bike you know like some stupid question like that and that made me feel really uncomfortable and that now like I'm able to you know go like outside showing my arm and just you know like regaining confidence in my body getting tattoos that are meaningful to me that just makes me feel confident so I don't know like regaining confidence in a sarcoma patient is just I don't know it feels like it's it's a big thing <laughs> yeah and it's a process it sounds like where you have to build it build it up I like exactly. that approach, though, of body positivity so what's helped you I, I hear you say you you just you've gotten tattoos, you're like going out with more confidence, but what helped you actually build that confidence? You have actually have to get outside of your comfort zone. Like my psychologist said, like, just go outside for a day, like not feeling comfortable, but just, you know, like pushing yourself to go outside with your arm, just laying in the sun and you just do it. You're just like, okay, I'm scared. I don't want to do it, but it's, you know, it's like fears. You have to get over them. So you just go outside and you try to feel as confident as possible, fake it till you make it, and then you'll be able to, you know, it's different for every person really. I just, I work like that, but yeah, just fake it till you make it and just do things that your body, you know, that is going to feel good. Like, tattoos for me or just you know um doing exercise that's just not in an excessive way just in a way that you'll love your body a little more so yeah i love that very much um my last question is uh really quickly you do have um follow-up pet scans um yeah and you said a ct of your lungs why the ct of your lungs because um, for Ewing sarcoma, if you get um, a relapse, it's normally in the lungs. It's um, it could be in your body, but normally when you do when you do have a relapse, it's in the lung. I don't know why. Um, it just works like that. So I have a CD of my lungs every three months with the PET. And the PET scan of your arm or your body of a, a PET of uh, my whole entire body. Okay. And do you know how long that uh, you'll have to do that for every three months? Um, I think it's um, five years. And then after it's a PET scan for ev every six months for 10 years. Okay. And then it switches to once a year, maybe after that. Or... Yeah. Yeah. Um, so my last question is related to that. You know, it's, it's like you got that call. It was the best call, no cancer detected. Um, but as we know, survivorship is another is a whole nother journey and you're yeah. just start, you're just starting it so i guess so far um what has that experience been like and if you have any guidance for people on survivorship um to go see a psychologist first and to just occupy yourself it's a weird time with coronavirus but normally i would go to school you know like do things with my friends just occupy myself um don't stay in your room with you know like don't don't be on your phone all day just because you know you don't want to face the world just go out there do activities to just occupy your mind it's okay to think about it um because you know as my psychologist once said to me it's like fears are like a snake in the middle of a room like if you're stuck with the snake in the middle of a room, like the first hour you're gonna be really scared of it, but after three or four hours, if the snake doesn't attack, you're just gonna kind of distend, like distance yourself from the fear, and then you could get over it. So I think it's a great metaphor to live by. I don't know. I love that. It's very. It's a great image people can remember. So. Um... Wow, thank you so much, um, Ariane. That that was wonderful. I really appreciate you sharing your story. I hope my English wasn't too bad. No, <laughs> Sorry. Not at, all. not at all. Honestly, I'm and hundred percent. It was a wonderful interview. Couldn't even tell that English is not your first language. Um, oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> so thank you so much. Perfect. Um, so when the when the article